Yeah, I think that one of the things that came out from the conversation is that fast fashion isn't an entity on itself. It is an entity that belongs within the ethical uh, requirements of, of any viable supply chain. Um, for myself, Next as a brand, we look towards our marketplaces with, with one eye. So regardless of what the supplier category would be, whether it be in our home division, whether it be children's wear or it be um, looking for quick repeats for our mail order side, our standards prevail. Um, our behaviour and our approach to our suppliers is one of collaboration and partnership. Um, we know our factories, we know our tiers, we know our tier ones, we know our tier twos. We understand where the risks sit in our, in our, in our um, supply chains. Um, I think what we took away from today was that there was probably a lot of still of understanding from the audience there that a lot of people didn't seem to understand. Um, the other side was it was good to be able to stand alongside Jenny from Industrial and Nick, um, having worked with them both over the last year or two, um, especially with Jenny and Industrial and the work that we're doing with the ACT project, carrying on from the Accord, means that we've got momentum at the moment. and. A very strong set of aligned thinking of what we believe is the goal that we're trying to achieve for human rights within the supply chain, uh, regardless of which country or which marketplace. Um, the way forward is definitely going to be partnership on the tripartite between manufacturers, the trade unions and industrial leading that and ourselves as brands. Sure. So one of the main points that was made both, both by me and by um, Chris Greer from Next is that it's not really an issue of fast fashion. The issue of fast fashion means that there's greater pressures put on workers through increased volumes and increased speed, but the fundamentals of the problems of lack of worker rights were already existing in the industry for a long time. So the big question is what do you do about that, having accepted that it's an industry that is rife with abuses around pay, around work working hours around um, discrimination and violence in many cases. And then we talked about some of the actors that need to take a responsibility in this, and one of the prime actors, of course, is government. And we talked about the limitations of government in the way that they lack the capacity sometimes, they lack resources, but they also lack the will because they're competing at the same time for foreign direct investment from the buyers. Then we talked about the role of the buyers and retailers in enforcing better labour standards in the factories that they're purchasing from. And we talked about how there is limited capacity for a single brand to influence an entire industry. We talked about the way that there are other companies active in sourcing garments from problematic countries that do not have the same commitments to CSR and to, to equal rights. But also, even if they did, there are limitations to how much you can achieve when the entire environment is one that is based on exploitation. And then we talked about the third enforcement arm, which is workers themselves. And one of the main issues for industrial global union is the fact that workers are not unionized. And it is only through organizing into trade unions that workers can stand up themselves in their factories and enforce their rights locally. So rather than relying on auditing systems, relying on people from CSR departments from companies flying into countries to fix problems, by creating a proper structure of industrial relations based on representation through trade unions, you've got your own problem solved mechanism right there in the factories. You've got a mechanism that will also enable workers to negotiate on an industry-wide basis to increase their wages and then to ensure that those wages are paid. And that's what we're working with global brands on a system called ACT to make sure that industry-wide collective bargaining is introduced into garment producing countries. This will enable workers themselves to negotiate a wage that is adequate for them to be able to live and feed their families, but at the same time we're linking that process to the brand's purchasing practices to ensure that the way that they buy clothes, the prices they pay, the delivery times that they demand, enable the conditions that are negotiated through the collective agreement to actually be put in place for workers. So we covered a lot of things from um, the relations between ethical trading departments to buyers, uh, the commitment of lead firms, the competition that manufacturers are under, as well as the lack of voice and partly the informal working conditions that uh, workers are under. And I think one of the key 
things that I would think uh, uh, came out of the discussion is the importance of um, the various actors in the value chain, um, in the sector, in the industry, to develop uh, regular fora, regular discussions, negotiations um, about all sorts of aspects in the industry, ranging from uh, the way uh, relations between manufacturers and uh, buyers and lead firms are structured, the regulation of the industry, the regulation of the labour market, um, as well as the importance of um, enforcement at the factory level and there obviously not only at the factory level but there specifically the importance of trade unions in, in driving that change and making sure uh, whatever is agreed at industry level or at the level of the value chain is actually followed and adhered to. I think that was a very productive discussion.